College of Education and Human Development. And I want to thank you for uh, taking some time out to join us to have a conversation about reimagining uh, civic education for equity. I'm joined today by my colleague, Ariel Tickner Wagner, who's also at BU um, uh, Wheelock, and then Kay uh, Kwasima Ginsburg, who's at the Circle Program at Tufts. Brene Green, who's with the MICPA Challenge, and Ruben Henrique, who's with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Second Education. Great, so let's start um, with the, really the, the, the what and the why of, 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 of today. Um, so what do we mean by civics and why is civics so important right now? Uh, this quote from the late John Lewis really frames um, what it is we mean by civics education and why it's so important. Um, so he wrote in his last op-ed to the, um, in, published in the New York Times, oh, when you see something that's not right, you must say something, you must do something. Democracy is on a state, it is an act. And each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community and nation and world society at peace with itself. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting into what I call good trouble of necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. You must also study and learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this soul wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. And I don't really, you know, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyways, that, that, that over this past year, uh, we've witnessed and are still witnessing uh, the fragility of our, of our democracy in the United States um, and the deep faults that are ingrained within it. Um, from, from the election and its uh, ugly aftermath with kind of the big lie um, and, and the deadly insurrection at the Capitol, uh, from protests to racial justice um, and the pandemic, which really exposed the deep um, economic, health, um, education, and societal um, inequities um, in our country. Um, this really has exposed that, that as a nation, right, we've not yet lived up to, to the self-evident truth, right, as written in the Declaration of Independence, um, that all people are created equal and entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this afternoon, uh, we're going to focus on how civic education can be a means of building that more perfect union when it's taught in specific deliberate ways, accessible to all students and supported um, by the broader community um, outside of K-12 education. So we want to talk a little bit about the definition of the terms, but before I start, I want to let people know that if uh, you would be uh, well served by having closed captions, we have that available and you can, you can hit that link in the, in, at the bottom of your screen. So uh, civics, one of the big questions we have is this relationship between civics education and equity and, wh and what, what do they look like? So we're thinking about how civics education can be imagined to focus on real world issues, students experience and fostering students the desire and skills to be uh, change agents for our community. So part of that is thinking really through is how do we think about equity? And so for our working definition, we think about equity as having two elements. One is about how being transparent. How do people know they can be engaged in, 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 in curriculum and in conversations in their community? How can we make that transparent? And the other is ownership. Equity is also a theory of ownership. So part of what we will look for in a curriculum that is focused on civics and equity is not only how do I become engaged in our community, but also how, how as my community, how am I a member? How do I have ownership? And those are both things that we try to engender as we go forward with a uh, focus on curriculum that really builds a sense of uh, transparency about how I can be engaged and ownership that this really is my community with, with, with which I'm becoming engaged. Right. Um, so our agenda today, um, Ms. Harden and I will, will take a few moments uh, to share some current developments in civics and equity, um, including findings from um, the, the civics and equity listening tours um, and a report on the state of civic education in Massachusetts that was funded by, by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, we'll then spend the bulk of the time um, in a rich and lively panel discussion um, with, our, with our great colleagues and collaborators, uh, Kei Koshima Ginsburg from Circle, Verne Green from the Mikva Challenge, and Ruben Enriquez from the um, Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, and we'll leave plenty of time um, open for Q&A. Um, so you can write if you have specific questions kind of throughout um, the hour together, you know, as your questions arise, please type them in the Q&A um, and, and we'll be sure to get to them at the end. 
So thank you, Ariel. So one of the things that I want to share with you is, is uh, almost two years ago, uh, the, a group of um, um, people engaged in sex education came together under the, uh, with the support from the Hewlett Foundation to really think through this question of civics and equities and really how do we have a field, field building initiative around um, uh, civics and equity. And that started in April 2019 and it was a group of people from a national coalition uh, that was coordinated by the iCivics and Generation uh, Citizen Groups. Um, and in that coalition, we broke into three working groups. One was focused on civics education curriculum and program evaluation, what are high quality programs and how do we evaluate them? The other was how do we use civic education to drive school improvement and system change? And talked about the examples we have around the country of places where by having a live civics curriculum engaged in, the, in, the, in, in schools, they're actually building, they're seeing demonstrable change in student performance and engagement. And the third question, which I want us to talk about more today, is uh, how do we engage community and understand what a community looks for and wants out of a civics education program? And I want to share some of the findings we have for that program with you today. So it's the goal of the listening tour uh, was to get community voices understanding the steps necessary in creating high quality civic education and pro particularly around programs that are centered in equity. And so we engage hello. communities, of, hello, of, around the country uh, in Harvest, Alabama, Chicago, Illinois, Salinas, California, Boston, Massachusetts, Waco, Texas, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Austin, Texas. I want to pause there to really represent that a lot of times when people talk about national movements, particularly around equity, the theory that we don't engage the whole country in this conversation, we're very excited the fact that we could have some very good geographic distribution of the sites in which we held these conversations. Next slide, please. So I just want to set some themes and lessons we took from listening tours. And, and essentially, uh, talking to parents, students, community-based organizations, um, people who were engaged broadly in uh, positive youth development activities or were youth themselves, talked about some elements that successful programs would need to include. And so we, we share that, and this is available um, as, a, as, a, as part of a findings from um, this report where the, one of the most important things that a successful program would need to do is elevate student voice. We may hear loud and clear that if the program to be successful, it has to be responsive to those students in the area. So one of the things that we were sensitive to from the beginning is so often we create programs that look like there should be a single model that fits all, and we really know that doesn't work. And so one way to find a model that fits in a local context is to reach out to students, talk about what they need to learn, what the struggles that they're facing, and how we can help them thinking about solving it. So elevating student voice is a clear and important element of any successful program. The second is to engage parents in both program development and implementation. Again, with this understanding that if we want high quality civics that's really sustainable, we need to get parent involvement early and often in the conversations and in the listening tours that we're engaged in. It was really remarkable how excited parents were about the idea of their children learning about not just the three forms of government, but how civics works in their community and how their students can become more engaged and how they can work for their students. Equally excited about that possibility were community-based youth-serving organizations. They, in particular, had a strong feeling that they should be able to collaborate with schools that are creating live civics curriculum and provide opportunities in the community working with the schools that could be credit-bearing for students, where they would really engage uh, with problems that they're trying to solve their agencies, bring students in as part of the lived experience and making change and improvement in their community. It was clear that the more community has a prior interest or exposure to equity in K-12 civic education, the more likely they were, were gonna be open to the conversation. So part of uh, anyone who's beginning to think about what can I do in my community, the more one begins to talk about it, engage, uh, do some uh, media uh, uh, presentations around what it means is also a good way to start. 
Uh, the next is to demonstrate a commitment to centering the lived experience of, of students. So there are two pieces, one having student voice as part of it, but also to that it has to be really about what are our students experiencing? What are the problems in their lives? And how can we help them learn with their information about how our civic structures work to really address issues that face them? Finally, the district has to demonstrate a commitment to civic education by providing staff, resources. It has to be part of their state admission. If you really want to sustain success, uh, you really need to think through what is the district's com commitment. And also, and finally, state level commitment to civic education is also very important. So the more that if you want a successful, sustainable program, the more you gauge your state in terms of engaging this conversation, identifying um, standards, uh, building curricular frameworks, uh, uh, produce relevant, uh, relevant civics legislation, these are all very important. Uh, uh, outstanding examples which have been happening in Illinois where they have a state standard and then as schools start to comply, uh, uh, their programs start to uh, develop and evolve and they're having a real positive impact on uh, student performance beyond just what they know about civics. So the two core takeaways that we want people to have from this listening tour. The first is that successful educational program is no longer a function of that great teacher, that great principal, or that particular program. It's a function of the system working together to create opportunities for all our children to thrive. So it needs to be a system change, not just the individuals who, the individuals who are uh, the coalition of the willing. It has to be also people who are uh, bringing in a broader uh, um, groups. It takes effort and time to build that broader uh, communication. And then the final is that a live civics program to serve to bring communities together around student learning and agency. So rather than being seen as an add on civics education, particularly a live civics education approach can really bring communities together. So as we talked about the ways in which one would develop and implement a program, it's also about community building. And we know that particularly as Ariel pointed out in this time where we have a lot of tensions in our communities, this may be a great way to start building conversations across groups within community about what their, our children really need to, be, to learn so they can be thriving and engaged members of the community. Uh, so the, 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 I look forward to ha answering any questions people have about that when we get later on in the uh, program. So Ariel. Great, thank you, Hardin. Um, and so while the, um, well, while well, the listening towards really highlight, you know, on a national level, what's going on, um, I'll take a few minutes to kind of um, take a deeper dive in, in, into what's happening with, with equitable uh, civic education here in Massachusetts. Um, so uh, Massachusetts, in, in many ways, I think is a leader um, in, in rethinking what, what civics education can look like, um, particularly, you know, at, at the policy level. Um, so in 2018, um, the new history and social science framework um, adopted practice standards that include uh, civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions, um, along with an inquiry arc uh, for learning. Um, and the guiding principles include inclusive, critical, and culturally responsive, culturally responsive pedagogy, um, instruction in, in history and social science from pre-K through 12th grade, um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary learning, critical thinking, and social emotional skills. Um, at the same time, um, the, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts um, passed um, legislation, uh, the 2018 Act to Promote and Enhance Civic Education. And this established a civic trust fund uh, to fund uh, civic education um, with a particular emphasis um, on funding uh, low-income schools. Um, and also um, for the first time uh, required of uh, students in eighth grade and in high school uh, to complete a student-led civic project. And these projects um, are outlined as, as being student-led a uh, project and inquiry based, real world, goal driven, nonpartisan, process, fo process focused and action based as well. Um, so um, last summer, myself and, and my wonderful colleagues at, um, at Circle at Tufts, K. Koshima Ginsburg and Noria Hyatt, um, were, were funded by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to understand kind of at, at the even start of these um, of these policies being required to really understand, right, what's the current awareness um, and understanding of, of Massachusetts K-12 educators and school districts on these new civics requirements, 
what's currently happening um, in terms of the spread and depth of implementation of the content and pedagogical practices that the framework and the, and the, and the new legislation espouse. And importantly, um, to look at any systematic variation um, based upon educators' geographic location, uh, the context in which they're teaching, um, and, and the types of students they serve. Um, and so today I'm gonna kind of jump in, into some of our, our findings that really kind of hit upon um, that, that, that third question. Um, and and the, the, these questions were all answered uh, through, we, we conducted um, a mixed methods design where we had survey data from 580 K-12 educators and 113 decision makers um, and interviewed 45 K-12 teachers and three school principals. Um, and all this was, was stratified by, by grade level, uh, the major regions of Massachusetts, so Western Mass, Central Mass, um, the greater Boston area, um, and the Southeast of the state, um, and, and also by, by districts um, who had varying levels of students who were classified as eco economically disadvantaged, English learners, um, and had um, different you know, proportions of, of, of racial and ethnic diversity among students. Um, so I'm just gonna touch upon um, kind of a, a few of the main highlights, right, when it comes to civics and equity. Um, so first we found that um, there were no significant differences in reported levels of awareness of both the high school, or sorry, and, and the, the history and social science framework and civics project legislation. When we compared districts by geographic region, uh, the percentage of students um, who, who were classified as being economically disadvantaged, the percentage of non-white students and white students, and the percentage um, of students classified um, as English learners. We also found, right, that when it came to, to predicting um, civic teaching competency um, and these, these various indicators of, um, of, 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 of good civic teaching, um, that, that it was really professional development and teacher confidence, um, not district level demographics that predicted um, civic teaching competency. So the proportion of, ELL, of, um, of English learners, the proportion of economically disadvantaged students, um, and the, the percentage of, of racial and ethnically diverse students um, in a district did not predict um, civic teaching competency. Um, however, I do want to point out that, you know, we did only measure um, this at the district level um, and some of our interview data did point to some within school disparities when it came to accessing um, civic learning. Um, and a lot of this, um, you know, from our interviews um, was, was uh, because because social studies isn't you know considered a, a core subject area, um, and so social studies would typically be the place um, where where students were pulled for services. So as um, this middle school teacher shared, right, on, the only students who would not take the civics class would be students who are ESL. Instead of taking social studies, they take their ESL class. Other students who are not a part of that class are rather in a life skills kind of program. Um, right, so again, kind of pointing to the need um, to further research and understand and unpack um, what, what discrepancies may be taking, may be taking place within schools. Um, we did also find grade level disparities, uh, where this maybe doesn't come as a surprise, but um, secondary teachers did report more awareness and implementation um, of, of, of civics teaching and learning than elementary teachers. Um, so, you know, particularly I'll highlight that, you know, um, only 8% of elementary teachers say that they teach social studies at least four hours a week. Um, and 28% uh, did not have any specific time dedicated to social studies. Um, elementary school teachers in districts with high proportions of English learners and economically disadvantaged students um, were also more likely to report less dedicated time um, to social studies as well. Um, so again, kind of pointing to a real need to kind of increase the time uh, that, that, that elementary school teachers have to engage um, in important um, civic learning. Um, we did also find some variability when it came to teachers reports of their equity focused content and instruction. So this is just, you know, kind of a few examples of this. Um, really importantly, um, you know, over 90% of K-12 educators in our sample agreed that students can make a positive difference in their communities. Um, so educators beliefs are kind of really behind, right, this idea of, of students as, as being change makers. Um, it was a little more nuanced when it came to, to culturally um, responsive teaching, uh, where 74% of elementary teachers and 58% of middle and high school teachers um, agreed that each student brings a wealth of relevant civic experience and knowledge that contributes to learning for everyone in my classroom. Um, and importantly, uh, two thirds of middle and high school teachers support learning through inquiry. Um, you know, we, we did at the same time find um, through our interviews that there were some patterns of 
um, of, of, of teachers, you know, having students take action devoid of inquiry um, or engaging in, in inquiries and research kind of devoid of, of taking action. Um, so, you know, to summarize, you know, as listening tours um, and this, this report on civic education in Massachusetts point to, there are some great developments um, happening, right, when it comes to reimagining civics for equity. Um, and, and there's also, you know, a lot of more work that, that needs to be done. Um, so kind of one way um, and one important approach in thinking through kind of, you know, um, you know how we continue to make progress um, in implementing equitable um, civics learning um, is that, you know, thinking through how the policy community and research sectors, right, all these various stakeholders can work together uh, to support K-12 schools and educators um, in, in this really important work. And so that's that's where um, we'll, we'll turn to, to our great panelists um, to begin to kind of think think through, um, you know, kind of how, how various uh, stakeholders can work together um, in, in reimagining civics education. So from there, I will turn it over um, to Harden and our panelists. Great, thank you, thank you. So uh, you want to join us back. So um, if, if, as, as you come back in, I just want to let all the uh, participants know that there's a Q&A. So if you have any questions, just put them in the Q&A and then we'll monitor that. And then when we're done the, um, uh, the uh, our conversations here, uh, we'll come back and um, uh, answer, answer your questions, uh, questions and hopefully with good answers. So first off, I want to have uh, each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves and talk about how they see their current work uh, aligned with equity and civics. So I'll start with Kay, then Ruben, then Vernet. Thank you and good afternoon and great presentation. Thank you for introducing those ideas. I'm Kay Kawashima Ginsberg. I'm the director of the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement Circle at Tisch College which is based at Tufts University. Um, the way we at Circle think about the intersection of equity and civics is really essential part of our work because that's one of the main things we study and learn from. And the way we think about it is that it, this equity has to be the condition for all of the work we do. So we talk about it all the time in our team and then we try to really think about how to make sure that we're holding up that principle throughout our work. In three big buckets, we Sort of, I think I can sort of think about some of the examples of the work that I, we do. So one is really thinking about those local civic engagement and education work, that kind of thing to Harding, really listen carefully. And I was also at the pleasure of summarizing some of that. And that's where really rich intersectional collaborations are often happening. They also enable a lot of systemic change when they're able to involve different stakeholders, have students on board, or make sure that the teacher voices are always part of the picture. So we've worked really long time with folks in Illinois and Florida as they passed civics law and then went to implement it. And those are where we learned a lot about how to really make sure there's access equity and there's sort of opportunity to succeed kind of equity. And those are two different things, so they're really related. So we make sure there's aid first access equity and then make sure there's also continuous work based on the research sometimes we get to do to work with a partner to make sure there's equity and opportunity to succeed as well. In the second bucket, we work quite a bit with out of school organization and namely recently we worked with six different communities that um, had initiatives to address COVID impact in local communities by young people as leaders. And there too, we learned a lot of what Harding said earlier, which is that we really have to listen to young people and how to really make sure that we're not only including and inviting young people, but actually having them lead, because there are many, many ways in which they teach us so many lessons about what we can be doing, um, and especially with regards to equity, because the student population is often much more diverse than the educator and for sure researcher population. It's really a lot that they can teach um, in consistent language of lived civics. So I've been personally learning a lot from those young people and just rethinking what we do, which is, mm -hmm. I think is an important part of all of our equity journey. And lastly, with national initiatives such as equity in civics. And most recently, I was part of the Educating for American Democracy initiative, which just launched last week. So I'll try to paste the link to Q&A later. Um, those are the kinds of efforts that are really done to make sure we're starting to really speak the same language 
and having a shared understanding of some of the concepts, or if there isn't clarity, we're trying to really make sure we are reaching that clarity. So with civics and social studies community, I think it's been really important for me to at least participate in that conversation. And in other cases outside of equity and civics, making sure that I'm taking the time to speak up for those issues related to equity and making sure that language stays and our commitment stays in a way that we can show up to our partners that we work with locally and nationally. So I'll stop there. That's great. And, and your final point about the need to monitor this is that it doesn't just, you, don't, you don't say it once, it's a constant conversation, constant attention is pretty important. So Ruba, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about uh, what you're doing and, and how that aligns with this work. Absolutely, thanks. And thank you so much for having me today. Um, as Hardin said, my name is Ruben Henriquez. I'm the history and social science content lead at DESE. Um, previously a high school history teacher and actually before that was a mentor for GC. Um, back in Generation Citizen, back when it was just starting up. That's my little civics claim to fame. Um, sort of at the biggest level, my job really involves making sure that all students have access to high quality history and civics education, um, kind of in the most broad form. That's across race, ethnicity, geography, grade level, um, et cetera. And high quality history, as, as we understand it, is not just a history class, but is a history of social studies class that brings in things like civics and action based civics in particular that connects the students identity and lived experience that gives them the tools to critically examine the world around them. Um, as well as injustice in the past, not only in the present. So sort of thinking about equity in two ways equity in terms of scope of access to education, but also equity in terms of what's actually happening in the classroom and the kinds of pedagogical practices and curricula that students are being exposed to. Um, and so as, as Ariel did a really good job of kind of teeing up more specifically what that looks like right now. So we are really lucky that out of this hard work of legislatures and nonprofit organizations and research groups like Circle um, and all this advocacy several years ago, we have some really robust state policy um, that we can use as a foundation to support really strong civic education. So this year is the first year that every eighth grader in Massachusetts is now supposed to be provided with a student led civic action project. Uh, and then one more time in high school. So that's a pretty big shift, um, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's one of the potential to be really empowering um, and really drive that kind of equitable lived civics that you were talking about, Hardin. So part of, a big part of my job right now is running professional development, uh, creating resources, guidance, giving one-on-one -on -one support to teachers trying to figure out how to do this in the pandemic um, to sort of help teachers see the possibilities and the excitement of this sort of work. Um, and, and help them feel able to, to do it with their students. Um, one of the things, there was like a little image on the screen, we have a civics project guidebook, which is really where we do the most sort of laying out of the expectations of what these projects should look like. Um, and we actually were just doing some revision last fall and, and, and maybe doing another, another kind of round um, in the next school year to really go into more detail explicitly around issues of equity and cultural responsive pedagogy. So trying to te show teachers, how can this really be a vehicle? We know that you know, cultural responsive teaching is something a lot of schools and districts are really focused on. And we think this is a huge way to invite in students identities, to think about what matters to them, to see their communities as really assets and allies in this work. Um, and how can we help teachers see, see that rich potential here? So you know, as I said, we're doing everything from professional development to resources. Um, as Ariel mentioned, you know, really trying to target the resources financially that we're making available to schools towards those districts that are often underserved um, or that don't have the resources to bring in their own PD. Um, and so sort of, you know, can we provide grants that are going to help to increase the equitable access um, and, and really trying to honestly get, get schools and districts to see our work around civics more in a support role than in an accountability role, which like is really how they're used to often interacting with DESE. So trying to take those conversations that often start out as like, okay, well, what do I need to do to check the box that the kids got the civics project this year and turn it into like, well, what is actually the goal of these projects and how can we make them meaningful? And how can I, how can I get you on board with this? And like, see it as a really, it should be an opportunity. It should be a thing that you're really yep. excited about, not just a, a box to check. Um, and so we're continuing to, to, to do that work and to target our resources, our grants, our guidance around equity um, and around the potential of, of action-based civics. And that's sort of, you know, the bulk of my work. And then I would also just add, because Hardin, you mentioned the system, right? Like there's the research angle, there's the community organizations, there's the policy. 
Um, and I am sort of well positioned and from the DESI angle to try to help navigate and coordinate those different parts of the system. So, you know, re working with folks at Circle, I know we're going to talk about this next, so I won't go into too much detail, but we sort of do have this like bird's eye view a little bit and trying to help all these really powerful and exciting pieces move together a little. Great, thank you. That is very exciting work. Verne, how about, uh, welcome from Chicago in the Windy City. It's cold, probably good and cold out there. <laughs> it's better than it was. So we'll, we'll take this over the snow we've had. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Verne Green. I'm the executive director of MIGFA Challenge Illinois. Um, MIGFA Challenge is actually a national organization. We have um, chapters in DC. We do some work in California and um, kind of um, several other states uh, in between. Really our mission is to um, develop young people to be empowered, informed, and active um, citizens who will promote a just and equitable society. Um, and the way that we do that is kind of twofold and that's how we are are, um, engage in equity. We do some direct youth work. So when Kay mentioned, you know, nonprofit organizations or after school organizations, we provide that support where young people actually get the chance to participate, to actually engage, um, be civically engaged. We have, um, we operate several youth councils either um, on a citywide level. We have one that interacts with our superintendent of schools and provides youth voice and feedback um, to our district superintendent, um, as well as to other major systems across the city of Chicago. We also do some neighborhood-based um, youth councils where we provide um, our young people are giving sort of their advice and expertise and their shared experience to their aldermen, which are our local um, elected officials, a community-based elected officials. So allowing young people the chance to, to really live out um, their civic engagement to participate mm -hmm. in the process by bringing their shared, um, their lived experience and their shared experience because we have students um, across different neighborhoods or across the city that attend different schools all looking at um, the same issue. We have a group of youth who are looking at public health. So during COVID, you know, really how that has impacted, how that um, the crisis has impacted their families, their education, um, their finances, um, mm -hmm. and really talk to uh, decision makers, electeds um, in the city who actually have the ability to make some change. So that's one side of our work. Another side of our work, and we really see that um, as part of our equity commitment, we prioritize youth from communities whose voices typically are not heard. Um, we also do not have an, a grade requirement. You don't have to be the honor student to have a voice. And um, we actually talk to teachers and ask them to target students who aren't necessarily the leaders in the classroom, but it's interesting with it. We really work to build those leaders. Also the other side of our work, um, we work in classrooms. So a lot of what Ruben was talking about with helping um, teachers to really activate those action civics um, projects. We have a curriculum that our teachers use, but even if they don't use our curriculum part of, you know, as we talked about some of the state requirements around um, engaging in civics, we're an organization that really helps the teachers to figure out how do I um, create an action civics project with my students? How do I connect that project to um, a community-based organization? So we have staff that work with our teachers locally to really help them to um, uh, help their students to take action on, on some of those projects. And then we also showcase them. We have an, an annual showcase with it literally students from across the city have, are sharing what their projects were and we invite stakeholders from across the city. So if it's, a, if it's something around safety, we've invited representatives from the police department or community um, policing to come and hear what young people are saying about their community um, in particular and invite multiple stakeholders to, to hear and listen to our young people. So it doesn't feel like um, youth are just doing projects for project's sake, that it's mm -hmm. actually taking a project and putting it in front of someone who has the ability to make the change that young people um, are really, really calling out. So again, the way we engage is really, again, trying to get the voice um, to students and um, to teachers, helping teachers to help their students find their voice. It's often a cyclical process that we mm -hmm. start with the teacher, they get really excited, they share the curriculum, students get excited about taking action, and then they apply to one of our um, direct youth facing programs. At the end of the MICFA experience at, high, at the end of high school, we actually place students in the offices of elected officials. So they get a paid internship. We actually count that as an equity issue also. For many of our young people, in order to get a job in a, in a government job or a job in the office of elected officials, that's free, that's volunteer 
volunteer. Those are free internships. And we've realized that our young people don't have that luxury of taking free experience. Um, so we fundraise so that they actually get paid for their time. And our Lieutenant Governor takes them, our you know state senators take them, our federal senators take them in their Chicago office. So we do that actually in Chicago as well as in Washington DC, really giving mm -hmm. young people and young people who would not have had the opportunity otherwise to do that up close and personal. So I feel really privileged to have been last because I feel like a lot of what you guys have covered is kind of what we are um, doing you know our best to try to put in action at a time that's really challenging and at a time and we'll get into this mm -hmm. with the challenges where young people you know are almost demanding that we do better which i i appreciate um they're pushing us uh to do more because even if we don't give them opportunities to be civically engaged they're going to take them because they they've realized the importance of, of their voices at this time yeah. that's great thank you very much and 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 the next question you actually in some ways already answered, so I just added, and it speaks to the degree to which those who are engaged in this idea of a lived civics, active civic curriculum automatically are collaborators, automatically are reaching across sector, uh, different sectors, uh, political, economic, structural sectors in your communities to, to, make, to make this work. And so I just want to lift that up with this question. And if you have anything you want to add from what you've already said. And the question is, how do you see uh, cross-sector collaborations role in advancing equity within civic education? So I'm going to start with Ruben and Renee and then end with Kay. Yeah, well, I think as you saw from the like aggressive nodding as you were asking this question, it is huge. Um, and we're really lucky in Massachusetts to just have such a robust and uh, strong civic education network. The Educating for American Democracy Roadmap that Kay mentioned, like watching that launch, it was like Massachusetts face after Massachusetts face. Like it was, it's very much a document that's grounded ar around here. Um, and that's really exciting. So I can sort of think about both the research and the nonprofit sector and, and how I see in my work collaborating with both. Um, so from the research side, I think that the research into the current state of civic education has been really helpful in our work. Um, thinking particularly about the, the research that Kay and Ariel were doing, um, both the kind of reveal maybe hidden trends we didn't know about, some of the differences that they got into in terms of the strengths of elementary practitioners versus secondary. Um, but also to kind of give like hard data to back up things we sort of suspected, like we, we're not surprised that there's, you know, inequities in terms of elementary school social studies time versus secondary, but to see the really stark statistics um, is both sort of adds an urgency, but also something that we can then point to and in terms of making the case to schools and districts mm -hmm. and, you know, others so that this is a, a real problem. Um, but I think it's also really helpful to be then able to draw on that research to shape the work that we're doing. So even since they finished up that work, we've reached out to Kay and Ariel to talk about projects that we're doing, thinking about how redesigning our grants and targeting the grants to be aligned with the needs that they found in their research. Um, teachers mentioned in their interviews they needed some curriculum. It's really hard to navigate the landscape of curriculum materials. They're actually doing a curriculum review and got their input on what sort of things should we be looking at so that the things that the curriculum that we highlight are actually useful to the needs that teachers express. And that's just really powerful to be able to, to feel like we can respond to, to what's actually out there. And then in terms of the nonprofit sector, um, the, in Massachusetts, we have the Massachusetts Civic Learning Coalition, which is a group of about 30 um, nonprofits, research institutions, et cetera, um, Circle's part of it, iCivics, the John F. Kennedy Library, et cetera. Um, they are both a really huge advocacy organization. So they were really instrumental in getting that legislation passed in the first place. Um, but then they're also doing a lot of that on the ground work with implementation. And so we are talking with them constantly. Um, we actually just yesterday or two days ago had a, a virtual support forum for teachers about teaching and doing student led civics projects. And we were able to bring in some members from that coalition. So some folks from different organizations and connect them with teachers. Um, and we're constantly talking just informally, you know, what are they seeing in schools? What needs do they see? What do we know that is a problem that we maybe can't address from our position as a mm -hmm. state? but that they can with the more in-depth kind of on the ground relationships with schools and teachers. Um, and so sometimes, you know, there are things that we know are issues that we aren't, we don't quite have the capacity or the, the deep relationships to address that a nonprofit um, organization really can. And I think through collaboration, we can enhance each other's work really effectively. Great, thank you. And, and Renee, how about you? What are the, what, how can you see cross collaboration, cross-sector collaboration really drive this forward? 
Yeah, and actually, and I, I talked a little bit about, you know, the relationships that we have with our teachers and, and, and schools and um, a lot of our civic institutions across the city. So again, our, you know, Department of Education, Department of Public Health. The other place, and uh, Ruben mentioned this, is just from the research and really collaborating with our universities. I do see that's an opportunity. It was something Kay said that I was like, that's actually what we're trying to point to is also diversifying the, um, and making more equitable the uh, research space. And so for me, I'm a, pro I'm a classroom teacher. I taught middle school social studies. It's where I got my start. Um, but I also have a background in, in, in college admissions um, and just thinking about how we are creating pathways for young people to see career opportunities that they didn't realize. So the more and more we can engage with universities, like we do, we do some work with the University of Chicago um, Crime Lab and, and some other places where our young people are getting data from, but also wanting to show them that this is a career option for you. So this isn't just an after school thing to do. This is actually could create a pathway mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. you to decide that you want to go um, into research. We do some work in, in public health um, and we then have passed our young people on to a public health um, who've been on that council to a public health um, internship opportunity post like while they are in college and so many of them hadn't even thought about public health as a career option and then when they learned about it and realized how relevant again for a lot of our young people it's being real and relevant um, that became a pathway for them so to me um, there are there is some cross-sector collaboration is happening but I think there's even more opportunity particularly at the university level um, and in the research space and in the policy space to be able to show young people um, that the, their pathway and the skills that you are developing, you know, at this age and in, in your classrooms, you can continue to use and build on and take professionally with mm -hmm. you. That's great, thank you. Kay? I just want to really agree with all of you. And then and maybe I just add just kind of the things that I'm pulling from that and resonate with me so much. One is the importance of the authentic relationship in the network. I think when we do have those authentic relationship like we do in Massachusetts, or I can see this in Illinois and Chicago land too. There's a lot of real collaboration that's been going on for years. When that happens, when opportunity strikes, like there's a grant project coming, or there's an opportunity to do something different, they are able to mobilize that really quickly. And that's just how important it is for us to always kind of have that muscle exercising all the time. And particularly speaking from the researcher's perspective, we don't get trained like this in our school. <laughs> So I think it's really important that the academia starts to really think about the community as resource, community as partners and core educators for both our mm -hmm. college students, but also the way to give back to the community, is, which is to not research the community, but actually research with the community on the things that's important to them. So I think there's a lot of learning to be had there. Um, one other stakeholder I want to give a shout out to is a city government. So we currently work with city of Minneapolis election office to really look at a model of youth-centered uh, election poll worker program. It's nonpartisan, they work closely with high school. They incorporate about one third of all election poll workers to be high school students. And it's really something that I think is so important when you think about pipeline and attachment to community. Minneapolis, for example, has a huge immigrant community. Many of them are new Americans, maybe the first generation American in many cases. And it's really changing the way that different neighborhoods within Minneapolis can view the community and the idea of government, especially when many people come from war-torn country, for example. So I want to mm -hmm. give how important that can be to reach out to those city governments. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, shift the conversation just a little bit because I know that you know, we're very engaged and we want to get some time for the audience Q&A. So I want to go to the challenging question, right? So from your experience, what are the challenges that need to be tackled to advance equitable uh, civic opportunities and outcomes for you? So what are the challenges that we face in this work? And so if, if Ruben, if you could start and then Brene and then Kay. Sure. Um, so I think there's a couple of different buckets of challenges that we see. One really ties to um, what something that Ariel mentioned, which is just the marginalization of social studies, um, which is often, although it doesn't need to be, but it is often where civics work is happening. Um, we mm -hmm. know that just in terms of instructional minutes, math and English, especially at the elementary level, really get a disproportionate amount of focus. But then even some of those within school disparities, you know, the fact that this trend of students on IEPs or students who are English learners getting pulled out of social studies for their services and then never getting the opportunity that other students get. And so I think we do just need to continue signaling and, 
and really doing whatever we can to make sure that schools see social studies as an equal player alongside math and ELA and, and, and science. Mm -hmm. um, another huge challenge that comes up all the time talking to teachers and, and educators is just around the comfort with these conversations. Um, if you're gonna do civic education and, and do equity in civics, you're gonna talk about things like politics and power and identity and race. Um, and that's really difficult, sometimes because teachers themselves feel like they don't have the skills to have mm -hmm. those conversations. And sometimes because they're worried that even if they feel fine in their classroom, something's gonna trickle back to a parent or a community member, or especially this year, they're gonna be on Zoom and someone walks by in the background and like, hears something. And that's like a very real concern. And I think an understandable concern um, about sort of how all these land in a community. And if teachers don't feel like they have the skills and they have the safety and the backing of their own administration, I try as the state, we're trying to sort of provide that support and backing if teachers feel like, you know, they wanna use us as that grounding. Um, but that's, those are hard conversations and hard discussions to have. And I think that's still a huge barrier for a lot of folks. And then, the other one is is just um, around the quality of materials. Um, there is, you know, if you are a history civic civics teacher, you were doing a lot of like that late night googling to find your lesson for the next day to try to find the reading the article. Um, there's not a lot of it's sort of go to like really high quality, easy to find vetted materials, and sorting through that landscape can be really hard. Um, and so, giving teachers access to the sort of core strong curricular materials that they need, but then also the professional development to adapt those to their students, to make them relevant to whatever is happening politically, to do some of the civic action that you can't always codify in like mm -hmm. a, a lesson plan as easily. Um, and so that sort of instructional materials and, and professional development, there's just still really unequal access to, to the quality sort of elements of both of those. Yeah, thank you, Ru. And, and you looked up, one of the things you said I wanted to kind of go back to is, you know, the, the, the ability from the listening tool, we heard so much about parents' eagerness to be engaged in the conversation. And we know structurally that's so hard. The individual classroom teacher can't manage that very well. It's just too much. As you're saying, they're going late at night just to get the curriculum. And so thinking through how you can have a conversation with your community engagement uh, professionals, as well as your civics, particularly if you need to learn civics in the community base, how do we get that happening and how we facilitate that may happen is, is a big, uh, is a, uh, something we have to take advantage of. Otherwise, it's going to be too much for us to get done well. So, Renee, how about you? What are the challenges that you see? Well, Ruben named two of the big ones, um, professional development for teachers. Um, and curriculum. We've had so many teachers, especially now, the, the, the very real point of I am teaching this in the classroom, a parent overheard it, now was wondering what am I, what am I teaching? So, it, it, so teachers have asked us, you know, how, do, how can we help them um, in having, in facilitating not only courageous conversations with their students, but also courageous conversations with parents. We also just mm -hmm. live in a, in a, it's a polarizing environment now and, mm -hmm. and we don't know how to have conversations in general. So we go to Twitter or we go to whatever social media, you know, outlet it is to, to voice our opinion. So we're not also, also not modeling for young people how to have those conversations. Um, Harden and Kay, uh, we were all uh, in the equity and civics work and our committee, uh, Kay and I were working on the curriculum and it's re there's a lot out there. It's hard filtering it through it and figuring out what's high quality, what's not, what's relevant and what's not. So being able to give teachers a guide um, of what to use and also knowing that state standards are different and the requirements in the arc of the year are different. That's a challenge. I'll also say, you know, for young people, they also feel like a lot of times when they, their voices are heard, that they're not taken seriously. They feel tokenized. They brought that up in the listening tour. It was interesting to hear young people from across the country talk about, you know, people ask us how our schools should change and be improved and then nobody does anything about it. And so mm -hmm. then they also lose faith in the process of even hearing from them is something that is, is something that we have to deal with. And then I'll just name it money. Money to making civics a priority, whether it's in schools, whether it's in nonprofits, to scale a lot of, of this work is expensive. It's a lot of um, investment and um, just really figuring out how do we invest in, if we truly believe this is how you um, make stronger, equitable, more equitable environments, then we have to make the investments there. Okay. Well, you know, one, you know, but you're hearing this conversation for around, around the country about this, what we now see is these 
deficits in understanding about civic education, the, these conflictive moments, and hopefully people will begin to say this is this is a prioritize for our resources. So, so Kay, what do, what, what do you see as these challenges? So I think it's a challenge and opportunity. So the Educating for American Democracy project was kind of born out of this conflict and polarization, kind mm -hmm, of taking mm -hmm. that, yeah, this is happening. And this is before 2020 election and its aftermath. Um, and thought that, you know, that's what we do in constitutional democracy. Why don't we actually try to take that seriously and try to teach through that instead of around it? So mm -hmm. it's a really an experiment and that's why it's somewhat of a new vision in some ways, but we do recognize that it does cost money. It does need a totally different mindset and a completely different idea of school as a site of civic engagement. So in the equity and civics work, I, I think we heard that concept quite a bit. Parents desire to come, the students desire to come and actually have these conversations. What is the vision of our education? What, it, what does it take? Is it the policy? Is it the money? Is it the mindset? Is it the culture? But not many schools are able to have that conversation because we are scared, right? And it's a very, very, very reasonable fear. I would be scared too. Um, but I think that's when the community does have to come together. One of the things that I did learn from our partnership in Illinois, just watching literally thousands of teachers learn to lead a controversial issue discussion, is that the social support among the teachers and the sense of competence and confidence that they can gain by really doing this really well and then seeing the student reaction, which is a completely different engagement from them. Students do want these issues and students mm -hmm. do want to be seen for what they're bringing and experiencing. I think it's really important to remember there are ways to do that, but we have to yep. all commit to it. Great, great. Well, thank you for sharing uh, the work you're doing and the perspective. So I want to turn the uh, moderation back over to Ariel, who's going to go to some of the questions we've been asked and, and, and solicit some of your answers. Ariel? Yeah, so we have some questions coming into the Q&A. So we do have a few minutes left. So please, if you have any questions, type them in. Um, then I'll, I'll start from for this great meaty question um, from Willie. Um, how do you measure success? Um, in, in the civics initiatives that you're doing and the work that you do? For example, is it just to encourage young people to be civically engaged or to become tr contributors to our democracy? Are the partnerships and collaborations working to achieve the full integration of a culturally responsive civic education into our common standards of American education? Um, so I'll open up, so again, so focusing, you know, on, um, you know, how do we measure success? Um, and really, are we working to achieve this full integration of culturally responsive civic education? I can start and people should add. I certainly think so. And there are different levels of measurement, right? So Ariane and I and Nuria in this Massachusetts study started with teacher competency. What are they doing in the classroom? What do they think they can do? And um, those are important first step. But then after that, we do have to really look at sort of how the students from different backgrounds and circumstances are viewing both the school itself, the classroom, and what they're capable of doing. And it has to be through performance and demonstration, I think, rather than just asking students, do you think you can do that? Are you confident? Those are important part of this position. But at the end of the day, I think what I'd like to see is not so much just measuring individual students, but actually trying to understand the setting and how equitable it's able to support different students and having different needs and assets coming in. I'll just stay short there. We do spend some time looking at like civic knowledge and civic behavior. So we measure our success. You know, we we can we can do a pre. You know, how much did students know about this particular um, uh, issue or you know skill set? And then at the end of it, what did they learn? What we have learned about the civic behaviors though, is that um, that takes longer. So that's when sort of the longitudinal studies need to come in place. A young person who had, again, had several um, interactions, either they participated in an elections activity and they had a classroom experience. We see long-term that they stay either engaged in their communities or they, they make a career choice that's connected uh, to civics or their volunteer um, experience. And that's what makes it a, a little bit tricky, I will say as someone who has to fundraise um, for this work is sometimes people are like, what's your impact? And the impact is not is not always immediate, but we definitely mm -hmm. measure engagement. Um, we definitely measure um, uh, civic knowledge, but I, I hesitated because I was like, Kay's the researcher. I'm going to let her take that one uh, first, but that that's really where we've gone. 
Yeah, I would echo that. And I would also be like, I would echo the fact that Kay and Ariel are the ones who had to figure out how to like actually measure these things. Um, but we, when we sort of think about it from, from our angle, we talk in the language of civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And I think that sort of broadly defined, like those are the, those are the three things that success look like, right? Like I think there is a body of knowledge that's, that students need in order to understand how government works um, you know, how their how communities are organized, how they can make change. There's then the skills of taking action, doing research, working with others. And then there, there are these dispositions, you know, do you believe that democracy is important? Um, are you able to interact with people who really disagree with you? Um, and I think, again, like those are the hardest things to measure and perhaps the longest term, but in some ways the most important. All right, so thank you so much. Um, so we are um, just about at, at the four o'clock hour. Uh, so, so thank you uh, to, to our great panelists for engaging um, in this conversation. Um, one thing that, that Fernay said that really stuck out to me is that you know young people are demanding that we do better. Um, so I, I encourage all of us um, you know, to, to, to continue to think about that and think about you know, what it is we can do uh, to, to continue to do better. Um, and, and, and I think one thing is to keep this conversation going um, with, with not only your colleagues, but your family and your friends and truly everyone in the community. Community, I think is all all our panelists have shared right it, it certainly does kind of take a village um, to, to to make um, you know civic education equitable um, and, and relevant to, to the lives of young people um, so so thank you everyone um, so much and um, please continue the conversation great thank you all for coming and we look forward and please reach out to uh, any of us, uh, the panel, any of the panelists, uh, Ariel and I, if you want to find out how more you can become engaged or resources you want to share, and as we build this community, because as you know, Ruben said something earlier that really identifies something that I say all the time is once we as adults begin to cooperate with each other consistently, systematically, with care, then we'll build a world with our children that they can thrive in. So look forward to working with you. <laughs>